So hello my active in decathlon class. This is Mr. Salmingo. We got also a little Mr. Salmingo because Jake said he wouldn't watch unless the baby is in it. So plus I'm babysitting, so let's try this out. So the last section, the first section of art, we studied the art and architecture um, of Christianity in Russia. But this one we're just talking about when Russia sort of became an empire. What was the art and architecture like? The last time we looked at four different pieces, you know, like Saint Sophia and um, Christ the Great and Saint, um, the Cathedral of you know, Vasily and also um, the third, I forgot the other one. But anyway, long story short, now we have five new art pieces and buildings to go through. I know we're going through this really fast, but I sort of want to cover as much as I can before I'm the actual decathlon before I scrimmage. So let's get started. So first of all, um, talking about the Russian Empire, um, before I talk about an architecture yet, you sort of have to know the history of it. So we're going to talk about Muscovite Russia. Um, the Tsars, we're talking about Ivan the Terrible, and they make a little joke here that he was the starting Tsar, or the Tsar, so Ivan the Terrible. His art, remember, was inspired by Orthodox Christianity. There was icon paintings, murals, architecture, and art grew distinctly Russian. Um, the society, remember, is based on serfdom, so we're talking about peasants in a very, very severe lower class, and also an agrarian economy, so, you know, farming. Then between um, the Muscovite and the Imperial eras, there's this, play, um, there's this era called the Time of Troubles, um, caused Russia political, economic, and social people. In 1613, Michael Romanov's selection as Tsar entered this era of regnum. Michael Romanov ruled until 1645. So I don't know if you're going to remember all this, but there was a midpoint between the Tsars and the, uh, when there became an empire. You need to know that that place, that was called the Time of Troubles. So moving on. Um, Russia becomes an empire. It starts off, uh, if you follow me through this timeline, Russia um, is merely just a kingdom. It's just Russia. And then Peter the Great takes the throne in 1682. Or, um, he takes the throne in 1682. And then he starts the Great Northern War in 1700. Peter finally takes control of Sweden and the Baltic Sea. And then Russia has vast holdings and now is considered an empire. He sought to improve Russia's maritime power through control over the Baltic Sea. And then this northern war gave him basically power over the north of um, Europe. So here's what his reformation did. So what, what did he affect? So first of all, he brought Western style to courts. The French and Italian artists built and decorated Russian palaces and cathedrals. So this reformation, um, we have now more French and Italian artists. Education was now mandatory for Russians. The Orthodox Church's leadership was restructured. And then uh, an enlarged military um, the reason they were able to pay for this military to take over or to make this great empire is because they taxed peasants heavily. So you can see why there's this big upper and lower class um, divide. Peter the Great, he then founded St. Petersburg as a new capital. I know what you're thinking, like, great name. Um, he chose the marshy banks of the river ne uh, Neva, close to the Baltic Sea in Finland. So they're in the north. Oops. Sorry, let me go back. Um... He became Russia's capital in 1712, and then to distinguish Peter's role from that of the Muscovite Tsars, um, that's why he made it the new capital, St. Petersburg, and then there's now greater access to Western Europe, because now that's what his new focus is. So his continued influences, um, this one says building boom. So now they commissioned official buildings and cathedrals for the new capital, so now he wants like, you know, he made this new capital called St. Petersburg. Um, he required nobles to spend time in St. Petersburg each year, and it led to their commission of houses and palaces. His buildings are actually very strict, so he had rules for buildings to be built there. They had to be stone or brick, they had to be Baroque style, and they had to meet like a certain height restriction. Here are some things that you need to know. Again, we'll practice with the flashcards with the architects were Trezini and um, Jean-Baptiste Alexander Leblond. The traits are restrained, but they're symmetrical. This is We're talking about Baroque style. And then some things that are like that, we're talking about the Menshikov Palace, the 12 colleges, and then the cathedrals of Saints Peter and Paul. These are all sort of under Peter's influence, this Baroque style. After um, that, there was Catherine. Catherine was a, a German princess, or Catherine II, or Catherine the Great. Married her second cousin, Peter, um, heir to the Russian Empire. When Peter inherited the throne, Catherine actually overthrew him, and she became Russia's, and she is Russia's most famous empress. So there's a lot of things, hey, don't do that. Um, there's a lot of things that she did that also affected art. Um, she collected a lot of art, so she had her own museum with um, entire collections of art. She started a, an academy, so she was big on education as well. 
She, um, Count Ivan Shubilov started Russia's first Western style art academy. And then Catherine took over the school and renamed it the Imperial Academy. So it, she had her own sort of like um, school for art. And then enlightening, she studied enlightening, uh, and sorry, enlightening, she studied enlightenment literature and philosophy and maintained a personal uh, friendship with another famous sort of artist, Dennis Diderot. Sorry, Trey's going crazy. Yeah, look. All right. Now, you're not going to remember this, but the Romanov dynasty, this is the list of names, the timeline of what they all went through. So you went from Peter the Great, and then Catherine, um, Peter, Anna, I'm the Sixth, all the way, there's Catherine the Great, and then there's more, but I don't know if you'll remember them all. Then the Empire waned. So this is the last of the Romanovs. So by Paul, one, uh, by Paul the I's reign, 19th century Romanov dynasty saw its filled rebellion. The peasants resented it, they finally were fed up with it, and then art symbolizes like how the elite was so much better than them. So you're starting to see some tension between the lower and upper class. Nicholas II abdicated after the revolution in 1917. Bolshevik power, led by Lenin, came to power, and the last Tsar and his family were captured and killed. After the revolution, like all this imperial stuff, the family's art was lost, stolen, destroyed, or sold abroad. So they wanted to get rid of everything that represented the empire. So here's the first of the art pieces you need to know. It's called the Winter Palace. Here's the nice, cool caption. Just a cozy little palace. When actually it's not very cozy or little. It's 250 meters across this facade, and there's a thousand rooms in the Winter Palace. A thousand rooms, okay? Now, here's the history. Um, St. Peter, he finds St. Petersburg, and he builds the first log cabin. And then Domenico Trezzini builds Peter the Great's first Winter Palace. George Johann Matarnovi builds Peter the Great's second winter palace. In 1730, about 11 years later, um, Rastrelli imagines renovations to the winter palace. Elizabeth approves these plans, and then it's constructed at the taxpayer expense, and then you can remember like who's being taxed for this. Yeah, it's the poor. So this winter palace represented a new lifestyle, social mingling, co-ed gatherings. Um, Elizabeth's design for the winter, we're talking about Elizabeth over here, um, was inspired by the Palace of Versailles, which is in France, and the construction of St. Petersburg came at a very, 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 very high cost to peasants, who paid for it with taxes, and they're also forced labor. Your royal architects for this were Belton and De La Mont, again, Jean-Baptiste. Um, Yuri Belton was born of German immigrants and studied in Germany and Russia, and one of Catherine the Great's court architects. Jean-Baptiste obviously studied in France, because he has a French name. He was also one of Catherine the Great's court architects. And he designed several palaces. Again, we all are focused on the um, Winter Palace. Then there's another place called the Hermitage. And this is the north. You have to know the northern facade, which is this picture right here. First of all, visually, it looks like the Winter Palace. Oops, sorry. It looks like the Winter Palace and has a short, narrow base. It has six Corinthian columns in the front, so you can sort of see the columns here in front. The floor plan with the, um, has a northern pavilion a hanging garden, and a southern pavilion. And that's the Hermitage, northern first line. The next artwork you need to know, so we did the Winter Palace, we did the Hermitage, it's called the Bronze Horseman. And this isn't a very up-close picture, but here it is, the Bronze Horseman. It was commissioned by Peter the Great, remember he was the first um, guy credited to making Russian Empire. And the reason why he made this was to commemorate military victories. It was designed by Rastrelli, and Peter's death sort of delayed this casting. So it was supposed to be done earlier, but since Peter died, they sort of delayed the casting. It was finally made in 1747. And in 1800, Paul, uh, Paul I had a statue installed in front of the Mikhailovsky Castle, inscribed on it to great-grandfather from great-grandson. Um, it was made of cast bronze, and it took um, actually lots of years to complete because the mold broke um, during the process and started a fire. Um, the, ho the horseman actually appears to peer over a cliff because it was mounted on um, a thunderstone. Okay, so that is the bronze horseman. Um, here's the view from the Senate Square. So here's the bronze horseman, and then around it we have the River Neva, the Winter Palace, the Hermitage, St. Isaac's Cathedral, the Admiralty Building, and the Senate and Sinai Building. So we've talked about um, the Winter Palace and the Hermitage, and then St. Isaac's Cathedral we talked about. The bronze horseman is right there. Um, Next, um, we have um, a couple of artists you need to know. One's called Falconet, and the other one's called Collot. Um, this one, um, Falconet, was born and educated in France, um, oversaw sculpture production, and then returned to Paris after finishing the Bronze Horseman. 
Collot um, designed the face of the Bronze Horseman. He used um, Peter the Great's death mask as a model. Um, returned to Paris with Falconet, um, and they were the ones that were um, responsible. You need to know the names. Falconet and Collot, you need to know that they were responsible for the Bronze Horseman. Artistic influences of name and rights. Um, Alexander Pushkin, he first called the statue in 1830, 1933 poem. Um, he first called it the Bronze Horseman. Um, Rough Rider, Peter the Great's horse, representative of the Russian state, sort of rears and tramples a snake in the statue. And then an inscription on the statue's base reads to Peter I from Catherine II in Latin and Russian. The question statue of Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius was a clear prototype. So this is not the Bronze Horseman, but they used it as a prototype for um, a Roman one. Next, um, we're going to talk about portraiture. So we talked about architecture, now let's get into the art. First of all, remember in the beginning, all of it was icon paintings, and then Peter the Great rose to power. And he bought a lot of Western, you know, in the North um, portraits. So the first portrait you need to know is called the Portrait of the Countess Samalova. Okay. Um, the Countess, um, she had many husbands. She had Count Nikolai Samalov, an Italian opera singer, a French diplomat, um, probably Karl Briolov, but we don't know that. But the Countess had many husbands. Um, Nicholas I asked her to leave Russia due to her partying, and she brought nobles and intellectuals together. So she also was like a partier. Okay? She was a pretty um, you know, outgoing girl. The artist was Karl Briolov. That was the artist of this picture. And trained in the Imperial Academy. Remember, that's the one that um, Catherine started. His work exhibits classical Greek and Roman influences, represents a transitional period between neoclassical and romantic, and then primarily painted portraits. So that is that picture, and I'll show you guys these pictures in class. And then the last piece of art you need to know is um, this pretty cool thing, Imperial Peter, the great Easter egg. Okay. Um, it's made of different gemstones. It's so nice and shiny. It has diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and rock crystal. Precious metals has platinum and gold, and then also has enamel, paint, and ivory. Um, Peter the Great, um, well, we could skip all this stuff and we could talk about it. But this is the next art piece. The Great Easter Egg, um, the unsung hero, it says Michael Perkin. He was the production manager for this Easter Egg. And his initials actually appear on the bottom of the Easter Egg. It's four and a half inches of height. And then um, the height and inches of the replica of the bronze is one and three sixteenths inches. Okay. Post-revolution, after the revolution, the eggs actually set in the Kremlin Armory. And Stalin sold some to a collector named Ar it sounds funny, but it says Armin Hammer, but it's Armand Hammer. Hammer marketed these eggs in the, in the American department stores and sold them to Lillian Thomas Pratt and Meriwether Post. Again, lots of names, but just sort of know the gist of it. There's 42 of these Fab Fabergé eggs accounted for. Eight are missing, and there's 10 in the Kremlin. So a very, very popular art um, piece. And lastly, um, so just so you know that the, uh, the history of this Fabergé egg, first of all, porcelain is a Chinese thing. Peter the Great brings it to Russia. Um, the porcelain manufacturer is found during the reign of Elizabeth. It's then because of this imperial, uh, you know, during this reign, they rename it to the Imperial Porcelain Factory. The porcelain factory creates dinners for the imperial factory. So that's like the basic um, history of it. Okay. In 1742, he opens the House of Fabergé in St. Petersburg. His first son is born, and he manages the firm. Alexander sees it, sees over the, oversees the work. The firm is named Goldsmith by appointments by the Imperial Crown, and the first Imperial egg is incompleted. Then they complete 50 eggs. The Bolsheviks nationalize the House of Fabergé. Peter Carl dies, and then his sons open one in Paris. So those are all the art pieces you need to know in this section. Again, we'll practice, and we'll talk more of this on Thursday. So from me and from Trey, uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys um, next time. Take care.